Have you ever wondered how can I become more wise? You know, the scripture says wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom with all thy getting, get understanding. But where do you get that wisdom? Do you go down to like the Publix and say, I'd like seven pounds of wisdom, please? How much is it per pound? Uh, I don't think so. But I'm gonna share with you some concepts about um, how we're supposed to be wise uh, from the book of Ephesians in Ephesians chapter five. Here's what it says in verse eight. It says, uh, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the spirit in, is in all goodness and righteousness of tru- and truth, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. Then it says, see that ye walk circumspectly. That word circumspectly means wisely. See that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And then it says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit. So it, it, it's really interesting. It says, it says um, what, be, um, make sure in verse number 15, I think it was, it said, it said, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Don't walk as a fool but walk as a wise person. The scripture says, he that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but the companion of fools shall be destroyed. And so I think we have to first define wisdom, and I know I've defined it before in other other videos, but I'm gonna define it again today. But before I define what wisdom is, I have to define the prerequisites of wisdom. So wisdom has some prerequisites. I'm gonna go over here to my whiteboard, or my blackboard. I'm gonna give you some, some prerequisites to wisdom. And prerequisite number one is, uh, in fact, I'm going to write that, prerequisites, requis. I think that's how you spell it, which means these are the prerequirements. Prerequisite number one is ignorance. Congratulations, you were born with it, right? All of us were born with it. We were born ignorant. We didn't know anything. Now, what is ignorance? Ignorance is the absence of truth. Okay, so ignorance is the absence of truth. Now, if you don't know truth, then you're ignorant. Anything you don't know. When we were born, we didn't know our head from our foot. We didn't know our hands from like our shoulder. We didn't know anything, right? And so, so we were ignorant. But over time, we begin to learn things. I believe probably one day I was sitting there slobbering on myself as a baby. Not as an adult. I was going like this. And my mom said, that's your hand, baby. That's your hand. I said, huh, huh, huh? And I eventually learned that was my hand. But then I found out, guess what? I had another hand. And I found out they're not the same hands. I got a left hand and a right hand. I got a left foot and a right foot. I was like, wow. So not only do I have hands, I have like, I have, a, I have different orientations of hands. Okay, cool. So we begin, we replace ignorance by gaining the second prerequisite, which is knowledge. Now, what is knowledge? Knowledge is the accumulation of truth. And we begin to accumulate the truth. And when we begin to accumulate the truth, then we have knowledge so we know things. We know what our hand is, we know what our foot is, we know what our, we know what our eyes are, we know what our ears are, and we gain this knowledge. And a lot of people say knowledge is power. I don't believe that knowledge is power, I believe that knowledge is potential power. Right, And so we have to understand not, the more knowledge we have, the more potential for power we have, but we don't necessarily have more power just because we have more knowledge. I'm gonna see if I can move this thing over here. I can't, okay, so I'll do that after the next video. Okay, so now, the uh, third prerequisite is understanding. Now what is understanding? Understanding is the assimilation of truth. See, knowledge is when I know what it is. Understanding is when I know what it means. So this is one of the things I say about the Bible. A lot of times people have biblical knowledge, but they don't have biblical understanding. They know what the Bible says, but they don't know what it's saying. They know the logos, but they don't know the rhema, 
right? And the rhema is what it means. It's what it say. It's what it's saying. The logos is what it says. So, so the scripture says we're supposed to walk wisely, not as fools. Okay. Well, what is wisdom? Wisdom is wisdom is the last. It's not a prerequisite. Now we get to wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the application of truth. It's only it's only wise when I actually do it. So the application of truth is wisdom. If I don't apply the truth, now, there's, one, there's something that comes after wisdom. What comes after wisdom? Well, the thing that comes after wisdom is foolishness. What is foolishness? Foolishness is when, is the abandonment. Abandon, abandon, abandonment of truth of truth, so we walk away from the truth, okay? So that's foolishness. So a person who walks away from the truth, you've learned the truth, you understood the truth, you applied the truth for a while, and then you walked away from it. Why? Because maybe your flesh caused you to walk away from it, maybe your, your desire to experience something, to feel something made you walk away from it, maybe it was your, maybe it was your desire to, to know something, or your desire to be somebody, your, uh, what is that, your, your worldly ambitions, your need for other people to think something about you, right? So that's foolishness, so you walked away. So the Bible says we're supposed to walk circumspectly. So the wisdom of your walk is doing the things, applying the knowledge that you have. If you don't apply the knowledge that you have, you're not wise. You might be smart, but everybody who's smart's not wise. There are a lot of people who are smart fools. I've met a lot of smart fools. Can I get a witness? Where are my people? Okay. So we understand that just because somebody knows something, that does not make them wise. So the Bible says we're supposed to walk wisely. What does that mean? That means the things that we know to do, we should do. And if I don't do the things I know to do, I'm walking like a fool. The Bible says don't walk like a fool, but walk like a wise person. So make sure you're taking steps in wisdom. Now, what do we do when we start walking in wisdom? When we start walking in wisdom, one of the things we learn to do is we learn to realize that we're expiring. Like we're, we become more aware of the fact that we are expiring. What did the psalmist say? He said, Lord, teach us to number our days. Why? That we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. What does it say in Ecclesiastes? It says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there's no work, nor device, nor service in the grave whither thou goest. You're not gonna have time to learn anything. After you're di- dead, too late to learn. When you're gone, it's too late to earn. When you're gone, it's too, late to do, it's too late to love. It's too late to do anything. So what we have to do is we have to walk in the wisdom of an awareness that we are expiring and stop acting as if we think we're gonna live to be 875 years old. We have to go through life with a sense of urgency. If I'm gonna be about something, I need to be about it now. So that's the first thing we, we find out. It says that we need to walk according to wisdom. Are the wis- what is, let me ask you a question. What is the wisdom of your walk? Are you aware of the fact that you're dying and are you making every day count because you're aware that every day you live is one less day you have to live? Are you acting as if, oh, it's just laissez-faire. I'm just gonna go through life and just kind of do what I feel. I'm just gonna chill. I'm just gonna chill out. I'm just gonna hang out. I'm just gonna waste time. I'm just chilling. I'm just wasting some time. Are you insane? We have to have a level of intensity about the number of days we have left. If I'm gonna live to be 140, I only have like 30, what do I, what do I got? 140, I only have like 80, um, like 78 years left, right? I gotta be about the business. What if I don't live to be 140? Then I have less, right? So I gotta act like I know this deal ain't gonna last forever. And, and, and because of that, it, there's a country song, country, country music, country songwriters are so funny. They love double entendres, right? And there's a song called Live Like You're Dying. Like what would you do if you knew you were dying? It's like, you know, I'd... I'd um, um, something about go 2.7 seconds on a bull named Fu Manchu, right? They go bull riding, go skydiving, go, and, and you do all of these things that we keep putting off. Why? Because it, when we think about it, which most people try not to do, when we think about it, we realize that the quality of our life is not measured by the number of years of experience we have doing a thing, but by the number of experiences we put in our years. And see, a person can live to be 70, 80, or 90 years old 
and have 10 years worth of experiences in those 70, 80, 90 years because they just keep doing the same things over and over. Or somebody can live to be 35 years old and put 100 years of experiences in those because they don't just keep doing the same things over and over and over and over and over. It's really interesting. Like people say, well, Myron, this is all I know how to do. I've got 40 years of experience driving this forklift. But I got bad news for you. You don't because it don't take that long to learn how to drive one. You got two weeks of experience repeated over a 40-year time period, and that's how most people live their lives. They learn a skill, they add nothing to the skill, and they just do that whole thing, that same thing over and over and over again, keep living Groundhog Day every day for the rest of their lives. So we need to apply some wisdom to our walk. Okay, so we need to walk according to wisdom. Cool, but that's not all. We need to apply um, wisdom to our work. Hmm, how do I apply wisdom to my work? Because that's what it says next. This one's going to shock you. It says, he said in verse 15, he said, see that, you, see that you walk circumspectly, not as fools but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, a lot of people, this is another one of those verses, a lot of people know what it says. Almost nobody knows what it's saying. The, the scripture is telling me to work according to, to wisdom. Hmm, what does that mean? It means when I work according to wisdom, I work to redeem the time. Redeem my time. Now, what, is, what does that mean? What does the word redeem mean? That's what I'm going to go into right now. So redeem means the first definition that we find when we look it up in the Strong's Concordance. Redeem means to buy back or Buy up. So I'm supposed to buy back my time or buy up my time. You tracking? Y'all tracking? Okay, so I'm buying it back. I'm buying it up. Then the second definition is rescue from loss. So I'm supposed to buy back my time, rescue it from loss. And the last one is improve opportunity. So I'm supposed to buy back my time, rescue it from loss, and improve opportunity. You say, Myron, what does that have to do with walk, like applying wisdom to my work? Here's what it has to do with it. The scripture says I should buy back my time. Let me ask you a question. When you buy coffee, what do you use to buy it with? Coffee. Money. When you buy clothes, what do you use to buy that with? Money. When you buy a car, what do you buy that with? Money. So when you buy your time, what are you going to use to buy time? Money. How do you buy time with money? You buy time with money by paying someone else to do something that saves you time. So I have a landscape company that comes and cuts my grass every week. If I were to cut my grass every week, it would probably take me at least an hour and a half of my time. When I pay somebody else to do it, I bought that hour back. Oh, I don't even think y'all understand the significance of what I'm telling you right now. So now I bought that hour back and I can use that hour to invest into my relationship with my wife, invest that into a relationship with my children, invest that into a relationship with my granddaughter, invest that into my health by working out. I can do something else with that time. Why? Because I bought that time back. Okay, so I'm buying back my time. Guess what? I have a pool. But if I don't, I don't clean my pool, why? I pay somebody to clean my pool. They come by and clean it every Tuesday. So I, I don't know how long it takes me to clean the pool. It might take me another hour and a half. So I pay somebody to clean my pool, and guess what? I bought back some more hours of my time. But I'm married. It's not cool for me to just buy back my time. I need to not just buy back my, my time. I need to buy back some of my wife's time, right? So what did I do? I hired a housekeeper. She comes by, she cleans the house three days a week, she does the laundry, she irons the clothes, she folds the clothes, she does the vacuuming, she mops the floor, she cleans the bathrooms. And so I bought back my wife's time, why? Because when I come home from work, I don't wanna watch my wife clean the house. I want us to be able to sit down and invest that time into our relationship. And so now I bought back some of her time and I bought back some of my time. Like, when I come here, like, there's stuff that gets done here that I don't do. There's stuff here I don't know how to do. So what do I do? I make my time more valuable by spending my money on time, buying back my time. It's, it's really interesting. 
how, you know how if you invest your money over time, you become wealthy? That's because there's something called the, the time value of money. And if you invest money at a certain rate of return over a long enough time period, that money becomes more because of the time value of money. Don't, like the present, the current value of money is not the only value the money has. We have to, there's such a thing as a financial calculator. And one of the things you, there's a button on the financial calculator that's FV. What's FV stand for? Future value. So you can calculate the future value of money. So here's what we need, here's what we understand. Based on compound interest or simple interest or investing, here's what we understand. Time makes money more valuable. I know I said that kind of fast. I'm going to say it again. Time... Because of investing, time makes money more valuable. Watch this. Because of delegation, money makes time more valuable. I have, like, we all have cars. Cars are nice, but they, and they buy back some time, right? So, if, like, having a car gets you from point A to point B a lot faster than your tennis shoes, right? So we bought back some time when we bought a car, right? We bought back some time by having running water in our house. We don't have to go out to the, to the pond behind our house and get buckets of water to wash our clothes. So we bought back time through technology and through the techn- leverage of technology. But we also have buy back our time, not just through automation, but also through delegation. Now, here's what's really cool. If there's such a thing as the time value of money, there's such a thing as the money value of time. What is the money value of time? Every hour of my life that I buy back by paying somebody else to do something I'm either not good at, don't like to do, don't want to do, or don't, or don't know how to do, is an hour of my life I'm buying back. In fact, I might, buy, I might pay somebody to do something for an hour that it takes them an hour, but it saves me three because I'm not good at it. Are y'all tracking? And see, here's part of the problem. Here's one of the reasons, it, like the Bible's not just telling us to be wise in our walk, but it's telling us to be wise in our work. One of the ways that we can be wise in our work is to work in a way that buys back our time. The scripture says we should use our money to get time back. We do the exact opposite. We use our time to get money and we wonder why we can't get ahead. I'm doing it backwards. Are y'all tracking? So we go out and we sell our time to the highest bidder, $10 an hour, $20 an hour, $30 an hour, $50 an hour, $100 an hour, and we sell our time to the highest bidder, we wonder why we can't get ahead. We can't get ahead because we're not walking according to the wisdom of our work by buying back our time. Now, here's what's really interesting. If I pay you to do something for me, that I don't want to do, can't do, don't know how to do, don't have time to do, whatever, whatever the reason, I'm not, something I'm not going to do. If I pay you to do that for me, then everybody wins. Why? You get something you want, you get the money, I get something I want, I get the time back. The reason we do the trade is because both of us are getting more than we paid for. What does that mean? You want the money more than you want the time. I want the time more than I want the money. So everybody gets what they want. Here's the problem. Here's where you get stuck. Hey there, my friend. I just want to share with you one of the best business books you'll ever have the opportunity to read. It's called Boss Moves. Boss does not mean you bossing me around or me bossing you around. It's an acronym that stands for Business Optimization Success Secrets. And this is Business Optimization Success Secrets from a Million Dollar Roundtable. I have one client who read this book and in two months made $800,000 from what he learned. I want to give you the opportunity to get this book by clicking the link below or just go to Boss Moves Book dot com and get your copy today and now back to the video you were watching when you love the money more than you love the people that's where you get stuck what does that mean that means if you love the money so much that you want you don't want to pay anybody for anything you wish i just do it myself because i can save the money because you bought into the lie that money is a pool to be viewed and not a tool to be used. 
Accumulation, like people say, accumulation of wealth. Wealth is not money. If you don't believe me, go watch the video that I did on the fact that wealth is not money. What is money? What is, I mean, what is wealth? Wealth is the ability to create value for someone other than yourself. That's what wealth is. If you were stranded on a desert island with $15 billion in briefcases and nobody else is there, how much is it worth? No, well, it might be worth, if it's dry, paper to use to start a fire. Other than that, it's worthless. So money is a way to store value as long as you are in a community of people who value that store. Money is a way to transfer value. It's a way, it's not the only way, it's a way to transfer value. But money itself is not value. Money itself is not wealth. Wealth is your ability to create something for someone other than yourself. That's why, that's one of the reasons why it's easier to make, to earn a lot of money in a city than it is in a rural area because there are more people to serve. Are y'all tracking? Is what I'm saying making sense? So, so, so we want to walk wisely according to our work. And how do I do that? I do that by two things. There are two things that, that are be, would be very wise for me to do. Disconnect my revenue generation from time. Stop thinking in dollars per hour. Start thinking in dollars for value. What, what is value? What, or what, what is value? Okay, so let's talk about what that is. So, because I said, um, I, I, I'll talk about that on a different video. It'll take too long. So, so, and I've talked about it on other videos anyway. So, just go watch all of my videos and you'll have the answer. <laughs> okay. So, now I'm going to disconnect my revenue generation from time. That's number one. And then number two, I'm going to use my money to buy back my life. The, the most valuable thing I've ever bought in my life is not a house, it's not a car, it's not an article of clothing, it's not a vacation. The most valuable thing I've ever bought in my life is I've bought back the rest of my life. That's the most valuable thing I've ever bought. I would recommend you do the same thing. So now we're talking about walking wisely according to our work. We talked about walking wisely the walking in wisdom period, then we talk about walking applied wisdom to our work, and then we need to walk wisely according to the will of God. What does the will of God mean? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna define that for you as well. Okay, it said in verse number 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So, I'm not gonna go into the details of being filled with the Spirit because I just did a video on that a couple of weeks ago, so I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna go into the detail about walking according to the wisdom of the will of God. So, I believe that success can only be defined one way. Discovering the purpose of your life. Develop yourself for that purpose and then deploy yourself in that purpose. If you do anything else, you've wasted your life. I'm gonna say that one more time. Success can only be defined as discovering the purpose for your life, developing yourself for that purpose, and then deploying yourself in that purpose. That is the purpose. That's the, to me, that's the definition of success. If you do something other than the thing you were created for, you're not successful. You might make a lot of money. You might be rich, but you're still not successful. If you didn't do that, like, I could take my Mercedes out there, and I could open up the sunroof, and I could fill it up with dirt and park it in my front yard and plant some trees in it, and it'll be an expensive flower pot, but it wouldn't be used for what it was created for. So I basically wasted the, the, the whole purchase of that car was wasted. And when you fill your life up with anything other than the purpose for which you were created, you are like a Mercedes flower pot in somebody's front yard. So what is the will of God for my life? I'm going to tell you what your purpose is. And I'm, I'm going to say it in a sentence, and then you have to go discover how to fill in the details, right? I'm going to give you the numbers. You know how we used to paint by numbers? I'm going to give you the numbers, and you can go paint it later. You ready? Here it is. Your purpose, my purpose, is to live in your creative space and make the world a better place. How do I live in my creative space? I discover the things that I'm good at and the things that I love to do, and I do those things to serve people other than me. It's so simple. How could it be that simple? Now, here's what's fascinating. 
One of the reasons it's not good for man to be alone is because no human being, no man, no one man, no one woman has everything. No one man, no one woman is good at everything. What's amazing, what's mind-blowingly amazing is I am really good at the stuff that I'm good at and the stuff I'm bad at, I'm worse at that than I am good at the things I'm good at. <laughs> but there are so many things that I'm bad at that my wife is great at. And there are things that she's bad at that I'm great at. And if we were both great at the same things, one of us would be unnecessary. In fact, both of us would be unnecessary to each other. How many of y'all tracking? And by the way, I know those differences, like sometimes they create friction. But beyond the friction, they create fulfillment. If we can get past the friction, we can get to that place of fulfillment. Like, here's the reality. There are people that you, in your life that you're going to love, but you ain't going to like them all the time. <laughs> can, I get, can, I get, can I get a witness, right? And the reality is a part of our maturity is developing our ability to work well with people, watch this now, who are different than we are because Opposites attract until what? Until they attack. But then after that, what we have to do is we have to get back to the place where we give people room to be different than us and understand that doesn't make them wrong, it just makes them different. So, I will say this about what I, about, I believe this about the will of God. I don't believe specifically you will discover the will of God for your life until you yield to it before you know what it is. What does that mean? You have to be willing to do what God has created you for even before you discover it. Now here's what's fascinating. In Romans chapter 12 it says this. Chapter 12 verse 1. I beseech you therefore brethren. Beseech means beg. I beg you. Therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable for us who've been redeemed by the blood of the lamb. It's, it's reasonable for us to yield our bodies as a living sacrifice. Like in the Old Testament, they had burnt offerings that they would kill these animals and they would cut them in pieces and they would put them on an altar and they would burn the whole, up the whole thing. It's an illustration, God, you, have every, you can have all of this. Well, our lives are supposed to be living burnt offerings. We're supposed to burn all of the energy of our lives as an offering to God. Anyway, then it says, and be not conformed to this world. The word conformed means to be made like something with pressure from the outside. It's like a cookie cutter. Like we all used cookie cutters before, right? Sometimes when I was a little kid, my mom, we'd make cookies. We wouldn't even use a cookie cutter. We'd just use a glass, right? And you cut the cookies with a glass. Or you cut biscuits with a glass, right? Y'all remember that? Or with a jar, right? Okay. So, and so that word, that word, be not conformed, don't be made like the world with pressure from the outside. But be transformed. What's transformed? It's metamorphosized. It's like, a, it's like a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and from the inside out becomes a butterfly. So the Bible says, don't be made like the world with pressure from the outside, but be transformed, metamorphosized by, reno, by the renewing of your mind from the inside. Now the word renew is not just renew. The word renew literally means renovation. And when you renovate something, you tear out all the old stuff and then you put in new stuff. And it, renovation is not covering up the old stuff with new stuff. Renovation is tearing out the old stuff and putting in the new stuff. And I submit to you that I believe the biggest problem modern day churchianity has is that we don't renew our minds. What do I mean? We don't tear out all of our old baggage, all of our old habits, when we discover a principle in the word of God, we don't say, okay, I'm gonna start doing this. I'm gonna stop doing it. I'm gonna tear that way out that I used to do it, tear it out, throw it away, and I'm gonna build my life on this new strategy, on this new truth, on this new, it's an old truth, but it's new to me. 
He says, be not conformed to this world. Don't be made like the world with pressure from the outside. Be transformed, how? By renewing, renovating your mind. And then it says that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That is not three different wills. God doesn't have a good will. He doesn't have a perfect will. If you miss that, you get his good will. If you miss that, you get his, no, no. God's good and perfect, acceptable and perfect will of God are the same thing. And I want you to notice the order in which they're stated, that you may prove what is that good and then acceptable and then perfect. So it's good first, it's acceptable second, it's perfect last. Why is that? Well, good is what God knows his will is for your life and my life. God knows it's good. Acceptable is what God desires it for it to be for us. He desires for us to accept it as good. When we accept God's good will as good, instead of thinking it's bad, like Joseph did, when he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Oh, y'all tracking now, right? Okay, so when we do that, when we accept God's will as good, even when it doesn't feel good, when we accept it as good, even when it doesn't sound good, when we accept it as good, even when it doesn't taste good, then and only then is God's will perfect or complete because he knows it's good, we accept it as good, and now it's perfect, it's complete. How do we do that? That's called walking in the wisdom of the will of God. When we will do that, when we will apply God's wisdom to our walk, and we apply God's wisdom to our work, and we apply God's wisdom to yielding to his will, we will live a wise and productive life instead of a foolish a destructive life. I trust that this blesses you. If you haven't done so already, like the video, share it, comment, and all the other youtube -y stuff that people do on YouTube. And in the meantime, in between time, I'll see you next time. Peace out, Cub Scouts.